Welcome back to the channel. Yes, I know the title is a bit clickbaity. Andy Warhol produced these two movies, but they were written and directed by Paul Morrissey, who made underground avant-garde movies like Chelsea Girls and I, A Man, with Warhol and The Factory. Morrissey then went on to make Flesh, Trash and Heat. Before he headed to Europe to make two horror movies produced by Andy Warhol in Cinecittà Studios in Rome. And they're two of the goriest, weirdest, and strangely erotic horror films of that era. And also, one of them was made in 3D. Both of them are WTF Midnight movies, and are curiously watchable for a modern audience. So let's get started. But before we do the movies, let's talk about the actor of the week. Given that he stars in both of these movies in this video, the actor of the week is Udo Kier. As the story goes, Udo was born in Cologne near the end of World War II, and the hospital he was born in was bombed by the Allies as he was being born, and both his mother and he were dug out of the rubble. Whether that story is true or not, I don't know, but it's a good story. Like many Germans of the era, Udo grew up without a father. He was the lover of Rainer Werner Fassbinder when they were both teenage hustlers, and at the age of 18, he travelled to England to learn English. Soon afterwards, he became an actor in Europe with roles in movies like Mark of the Devil and The Salzburg Connection and the two movies I'm covering today. For me, Udo is kind of like a creepy love child of Peter Lorre and Klaus Kinski. He has that creepy European charisma that serves him well working for all sorts of directors, including Gus Van Sant, Dario Argento, Lars von Trier and Jus Jakin. He didn't always get starring roles, but Udo is a welcome character in movies like the Story of O, he's also in Armageddon, My Own Private Idaho, The Puerile Ace Ventura Pet Detective, Blade, Barb Wire, which is, by the way, an unacknowledged remake of Casablanca, The Silly Iron Sky movies, Johnny Mnemonic, Shadow of the Vampire, Nymphomaniac, and Downsizing. Udo seems to cross easily between serious movies, cult movies, and genre films. As he matured out of being the romantic lead, Udo Kier never lost that intensity for which we know him. He has a unique style that has seen him through a cinematic career covering half a century. There's nobody in cinema quite like Udo Kier. He's a one-off. So let's get on with the movies. 3D movies are a particularly odd subset of cinema. I've never seen a 3D movie which significantly added to the film by having things jump out of the screen at an audience. They're a distraction rather than an enhancement. For someone to make a 3D movie full of blood, guts and obviously fake bats. Which seems to forget it's a 3D movie for long sections of its running time. is kind of crazy. Flesh for Frankenstein, directed and written by Paul Morrissey, plays like a Hammer movie that's taken a lot of Viagra and amphetamines. Udo Kier plays the Baron, a shouty, insane guy who has ideas of creating a master race of Serbian perfection by assembling physically perfect zombies and having them breed. His wife, the Countess, who is also his sister, is a snobby, aristocratic Karen, played by Monique Van Voren. But it gets stranger. They also have two children, a boy and a girl who we see dissecting their toy dolls in the Baron's lab when nobody is watching right at the start of the movie. A villager, Nicholas, played by Morrissey and Warhol favourite Joe D'Alessandro, is a horny stud who takes his sexually reticent friend Sasha to a brothel. Meanwhile, the Baron needs the head of a horny stud muffin for his assembled zombie, and, while scoping out the brothel, thinks Sasha has the head he wants. He then has him decapitated with a pair of enormous garden shears. Sasha's head is put on the zombie body and the Baron tries to mate him with his female zombie played by Dalila de Lazaro and that kind of doesn't work. Meanwhile Nicholas while looking for his friend is servicing the Baroness and the Baron has a mind-blowingly weird assignation with his female zombie which I'm not going to spoil for you but is incredibly crazy and the movie all ends up in blood guts and tears with a deliciously creepy ending. Like most horror movies of the 1970s, there's nudity and sex scenes. You will become overwhelmingly familiar with Joe D'Alessandro's buttocks. And the dialogue is amusingly bad and amusingly badly delivered in some cases. Head. Head. So is this a good movie? Um, no. 
It's a movie you should watch at midnight with an encore cinema audience along with a second movie I'm going to mention. It's a cult movie. It doesn't have to be good. It just has to be weird and entertaining. Flesh for Frankenstein is seven different kinds of yucky. But if you can slide into that exploitation appreciating going along with the right headspace, you'll enjoy it. It takes all that titillation and horror that studios like Hammer and Amicus were known for and dials it up to ridiculous levels. However, the production design and the sets are really good for a horror movie of the 1970s. And both of the movies I'm going to talk about have a secret source, which is special effects by Caldo Rambaldi, who went on to give us the 1976 King Kong, and that weirdly phallic alien in the children's movie E.T. Let's move on to Blood for Dracula. A year after Flesh for Frankenstein, Paul Morrissey and his two stars Udo Kier and Joe D'Alessandro returned to Chinichita for an interesting twist on Bram Stoker's Blood Drinker. This time it's set in 20th century pre-fascism Italy, and it looks good. The locations are well chosen. The title sequence is fascinating, In it, we see Dracula applying makeup to his eyebrows and cheeks to appear more lifelike and putting black dye in his white hair. He has a really somber and melancholy manner as he does so. And the camera pans to the mirror where his image isn't showing. The scene works really well. It's surprisingly effective. We then get the Count and his assistant, played by Arno Joging, who also played Frankenstein's assistant in Flesh of Frankenstein, discussing the fact that he needs the blood of an adult virgin, otherwise he will die. They decide to travel from Romania to Italy because Italy, being a devoutly religious country, is more likely to have virgins. So they get into the Count's jalopy with a coffin and a wheelchair on the roof and drive to Italy. There they find the villa of an impoverished marquis played by Vittorio De Sica, who has a bit of fun with his small role. And I hope you will show him all the courtesy and him like his service, Dracula. He lives in the villa with his wife, their maid, his three attractive daughters and a surly, horny communist handyman, played by Joe D'Alessandro. Mario, the handyman, is servicing two of the daughters and we see that in some detail as the movie progresses. He does things that DC tells us Batman doesn't. The Dracula we get with Udo Kier is weak and infirmed. He can eat human foods of a certain type, but definitely not garlic. He tells the Marquis that he would like to marry one of the daughters if she's a virgin. The Marquis and his wife are enthusiastic about this. They're broke because of the Marquis' gambling addiction. And a wealthy Romanian husband in the family will save the family home. As Dracula samples the blood of the daughters one by one, he finds that the older two daughters aren't untouched and becomes progressively weaker. Meanwhile, Mario is increasingly suspicious of Dracula. There's a bit to unpack in this movie. First off, it's got a Criterion Edition release. And that's kind of unusual for this kind of film. It's a very, very different Dracula movie. Secondly, as Dracula's assistant is sitting in an inn looking for a virgin among the townspeople, he gets into a really odd gambling game with a mustachioed local. Played by Roman Polanski. How did that happen? The dog turd was making a movie at a nearby set on Chinichita and asked to do a cameo in Blood for Dracula. Moving along from him, the movie is interesting because as things progress... A question came up to my mind on who is worse, Dracula, who is portrayed as a pathetic and infirmed individual just trying to survive, or the muscled, horny, politically didactic and sexually abusive Mario? It's an interesting question to ponder. The climax of the movie is absurd, mind-blowing and deeply crazy, even as it is crazily gory. Mario takes out Dracula, and don't pretend that's a spoiler to say that, because it's not as a Dracula movie. And he does it in a way not equaled before or since. It's full-on gory weirdness. It owes a lot to Carlo Rambaldi's skill as a special effects technician. You have to see the end of this film. It is mind-blowingly weird and mind-blowingly surprising. So these two horror movies, very atypical for Andy Warhol's interests and very atypical for the 1970s in the, in the amount of gore they have and also in the amount of sexuality that they blend with that gore. They really are cult films worth checking out, and if you haven't seen them already, if you haven't, or if you haven't seen them for a while, you should give Flesh for Frankenstein and Blood for Dracula a go. As I said, they're not perfect films, and some of the acting is pretty woeful, but there's nothing quite like them in cinema. 
and they tend to get a little bit forgotten when people talk about 1970s horror. So thank you very much for watching. As always, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing, hitting the like button and the notification bell. And let me know what you thought of these movies and what other sexy horror movies from the 1970s you really liked because there are a few of them out there. So anyway, look after yourselves. Get the jab. Watch some good movies. Watch some deliciously bad horror movies. And I'll catch you next time. Thank you.